Hi, everyone, and welcome to this special episode of the Passive House Podcast, recorded in Terrytown, New York, at the FiusCon 2021 Passive House Conference. Before we get started, I want to thank Fias for putting on the conference and for coordinating with us on these interviews, as well as NYSERDA for serving as conference partner with Fias and community partner with us here at the Passive House Accelerator. Thank you, too, to Rockwell North America. Their generous support underwrote all of these interviews, as well as our coverage of the conference. So with that, please enjoy my interview with Tessa Bradley of Artisans Group and Graham Irwin of Essential Habitat Architecture. Welcome, Graham Irwin and Tessa Bradley, uh, to this great this interview. I can't wait to interview you. You are both old and dear friends, so this is going to be awesome. Thanks for sitting down. You're welcome. Always, Glad to yeah. be here. So we're doing a special interview at the FiestCon conference in Terrytown right now in 2021. And uh, this is the first day of the conference. So you are both here to participate as speakers um, on a prefab panel, right? Correct. Yeah. So I would love to dive into a, a little bit about what you plan on sharing during during that panel, but I think it'd be fun um, first to dive into a little bit of your origin story around Passive House. Like, how, how were you introduced to Passive House? What was that like? Well, Graham got introduced to it first. So I think you should go first, Graham. Okay, so... He's also older, so uh, yeah. he should go first. <laughs> yeah. um, around 2007, and I've got, to try to, I've got to try to contain this as much as I can. Um, I was always in concern with environmentalism, and I was doing construction and getting more involved in design. And I kept thinking, like, why, why can't you make a house that needs no fossil fuels to run? And I have an undergrad in physics, which is just, you know, about as useful as an undergrad in philosophy, but just enough to make me dangerous. And I started doing calculations, and it was pretty clear, like, oh, PV won't work. You know, you can't, you don't get enough sun in the winter. That's not going to work. And I thought, oh, well, solar thermal, no, that won't work. And then I started thinking, well, I've got to get more solar gain. You know, and again, it's this transition every, a lot of people go through about, like, from production to conservation. But I'm like, oh, passive solar, you know, I mean, you're getting, you're harvesting as much of that winter sun directly as you can. So I was self-educating myself, um, self-educating myself, that's great. Um, get, like, getting all these library books, and there are all these books from the 70s about, Passive solar and you earth the ships. Yeah, That's I was. So cute. I had, I had like, <laughs> it was kind of. Well, there, I guess there was internet, but there wasn't that. You know, it was a lot of, a lot of library books. And I remember I got one, that a fairly modern one from Vermont about doing passive solar houses. And this guy had this thing where he used CMU bricks, all on like all on their side, like horizontally with all the channels lined up, and he would put that in the floor and then blow a fan through it so he could harvest more heat. And I was like, okay, whatever. And then in the back, it had a worksheet where you could calculate how much insulation and stuff you needed. Like it had a, a whole workbook where you would fill it out by hand with a calculator. And I thought, oh, I'm going to put this into a spreadsheet. It would be really convenient if oh, this energy model were in a spreadsheet. And anyway, <laughs> like a, maybe a month later, this this architect in, uh, in Berkeley who had been living in, in Austria came back and did a Passive House retrofit and he presented on Passive House and I was also going to all these local kind of green building presentations and they're all little pieces like ventilation's good and I'd be like oh, okay I get that but how does that fit with this other thing and, and I was seeking like the unified theory right because it was all these disparate pieces yeah, but not put together yeah. and um I sat in the passive house thing and I still didn't know that much, but it, like I, I saw it and I'm like, there's something to this. Like, and I would, then I became the annoying guy. I still kept going to these other things and I'd put up my hand and they'd be like, you know, ventilation. I'm like, what about passive house? And the people would be like, oh, that's a European thing. I hear it's really good. I don't know anything about it. So that again made me think maybe I was on to something. And then I, and I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, I, I, I remember I was at a story, I was at at a at a class about ventilation, and 
the instructor brought up a slide of air tightness requirements in various countries. And of course the US was not on there because we don't even know, didn't know what that was. And blah, 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 and Norway and this and that and the other. And I put my hand up again and I said, oh, what about passive house? I think it's 0.6. And the instructor was like, no, it can't be that low. Is that natural or ACH 50? And I didn't know, but it bugged me. And right. again, right. so 2007, I had a Palm Treo before the, like the pre-iPhone, but it did have internet access. And I knew about the FIAS website, and I knew they had the standard on the front page. And so I just went to that at break to figure out whether it was natural or ACH50 I was right. talking about. And they had, hey, we're doing a training. And, you were like, oh. and, and it was right at the, you know, I had a residential design business, and it was, everything was going to crap at that point, like right. the bubble burst. Right. And I just felt like, yeah. And then you had to go to Urbana, Illinois. I didn't know where that was. And you had to go three times over the summer. And I told my wife, you know, I know this is a stretch, but I really feel like I need to do this. And so I had frequent flyer miles that I saved up and went to this thing. And the first training was absolute chaos because they had no, no admission criteria at all. And they didn't think anyone was going to want it, or very many people were going to want to go. So they had a PayPal registration, and they were set up for 30 people. And I think the enrollment was at like 45 before they took it down. So it was just <laughs> right. overfilled, totally crazy. Passed. People didn't know how to use their computers and the whole thing. But by the end, by the third session, I had like the best friends I've ever had in my life. And that, that's my origin story. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And then the next year I got started training people and I'll, yeah. I, will, I will spare you, I'll spare <laughs> Tessa my impressions of her <laughs> origin and you can take <laughs> it like yourself. At like age 22 but, and you're, yeah. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm really tempted to share my origin story like in a sentence just to make you feel like an asshole when you're taking that one. <laughs> it, it, it's not going to work. It's not, gonna, know, it's not do you work. see the guilt on my face? <laughs> there is none. You can see that look a lot. It's <laughs> very terribly unguilty. Um, yeah, so enter enter Graham into the training session in Seattle, which I attended. Um, and I'm not going to do the mental math of how old I was, but I think I was somewhere between 22 and 24. I was quite young. Um, but I had seen Katrin Klingenberg speak at a library in Seattle. And that was that was a momentous it speech, was I think. A there momentous a lot of, yeah, speech. Yeah. And afterwards, I came up and asked if I could join her class. And she said, "Well, what do you do?" And I said, "Well, I run a, a small, you know, design portion of a firm in Olympia, and I have a degree in sustainable architecture. And um, you know, I had been doing you know fairly complex homes for a couple of years, actually." Um, like SIPs, ICFs, integrated with geothermal and photovoltaic systems. You're, you're like systems the, and... the original Passive House prodigy from the <laughs> Northwest. Well, it was, it was just so systems heavy. That was the thing that was like such a bummer about it. And you would spend so much money on these systems and the houses just didn't perform that much better because we just didn't know what, what knobs we should be turning to get there, you know? Like, much like Graham, I felt like I was grasping and I felt like there was some of the story, but it wasn't cohesive. And what, um, Katrin presented felt like this like more um, encompassing approach to what we were trying to do. So I went to her course and I was really intimidated because I was in there with uh, people who are really smart, like Graham, who was helping train and, um, you know, Joe Heron from Heliotrope and Dan Whitmore. And I sat next to Dan, actually, for our trainings all three times and uh, made incredible friends and was super impressed. It was also a shit show. Like, even though it was the second was it? training, it was like, like we were converting things from metric to English oh, yeah. and back. Oh, and like, yeah. oh, you know, yeah. people's computers weren't working and yeah. people were there who were angry, you oh, know, yeah. about what was being said. And like, I remember it was, that. It was, um, but like, uh, yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. And also things had gone to hell. Um, for the firm I worked for, um, the artisans group had gone from, you know, 30 people to five people right. in the course of six months. So the Great Recession was... Great Recession. I mean, it pushed so, so many of us to Passive House in funny ways, yeah. It did, yeah. I agree. And um, I, you know, came back and uh, from that training, my last training, it was also three, three days, I think, over the summer. And uh, 
I remember telling my then boss, Randy Foster, who's an amazing man, was an incredible partner to me, um, that I was going to quit and start a passive house, you know, company. Um, and he, he was like, well, that sounds pretty cool. And he immediately signed up for the next training, which was in Portland um, with Sam Hagerman and Skyler and a bunch of other super great people. And he got on board and I bought in and we became 50-50 owners of the Artisans Group. And with, um, within a few months, we were building our first one, um, which I'd leveraged a, um, a disgruntled design client that had had a bad experience with their builder into building the first one. And they were really smart, amazing clients, still friends to this day. Um, and they must have a, a 10-year-old passive house or something like right, that at right. this point. That's amazing. That still yeah. works beautifully and yeah. looks incredible. And they love it um, in Olympia. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. We, we started designing and building passive houses almost exclusively. We did that for almost 10 years. Um, and then we stopped being design build um, and became just an architecture firm. Brought on our third partner, Rusa Cassell, incredible architect. Um, and uh, her and I have bought out Randy actually last year. Randy has been um, sort of spooling down and he's heading for retirement this spring. He's really excited. Oh, that's great for Randy. Um, that's and it's awesome. been a wonderful, a really successful secession story. And Rusa and I's business has really taken off. You know, I think um, we're sort of a rare bird being 100% women owned um, in, in architecture in this industry. So that's sort of it. Yeah. And you have, you have projects uh, across the Northwest, Pass House Projects. Yeah. And Graham, you have projects throughout California and yeah. we'll be beyond probably a little bit for both of you. Yeah, I, think we're, California. I think we're licensed in like six states. Yeah. We've got work in Austin, Texas, and Virginia, and um, Vancouver, BC, Oregon, Washington. That's awesome. Pacific North. That's we're awesome. Mostly the Northwest. I mean, you have this this great portfolio of work that you've developed over the last 10 years, and, and you've been there since the early days to where we're at now, and now you're moving into um, things like prefabrication. So maybe we could dive into that a little bit and what you what um how you're engaging with prefab and and how and what you're going to share about that what are the lessons or um what makes you excited about it um in prefab so i am and it may not be my doing but i may be a bit of an imposter in this prefab session <laughs> Because, oh, that's so well, shocking. Two yeah, that's so shocking. shocking. And, yeah. look how, and look how guilty I feel <laughs> yeah. about it. Yeah, it's that face um, again. Never, there it is. It never causes um, trouble. <laughs> for two reasons. One, I'm talking about a, a concept, so it's a, pro it's a proposal. Yeah. Everything's And secondly, concept. it's a modular design. So it would very much right. lend itself to either a modular or a, pre or a panelized delivery, but the idea behind it is that it's a proposal for mass customization. So a home, it's designed for upzoning, single family residential properties in California now. They've essentially ended single family yeah, zoning. Yeah, super exciting. So it's a, it's a building that's pre-designed for economy of scale, but it's intended to be flexible for both community needs and the owner's needs. So it's designed in a, in a kind of almost like Lego block way in modules that so that you can decide you know what size units you need and how many units i love there are. i love how your your design solution which i'm very impressed by by the way um i love how it's sort of like you cutting in line like that's like my favorite thing about it is like i feel like i've been like working on this prefab thing just freaking forever like with all these baby steps to get to the point that i could do the thing that you're proposing to do and you're just like hey i've got this cool idea and we're like shit <laughs> that's awesome that's where we're heading it's really great. So, so um, I, again, I'm. It's a proposal, and it and it isn't so much about delivery as it is design. Although I'm I'm totally open to the delivery method. I will. Could be prefab. Could be could modular. Be, it could be site built. I mean, I think at a, at economy of scale size, it should be something mechanized. Yeah. But I'll also go. I'll go even further out on a limb with this, and I will suggest that. I really believe with projects that you need to set one target, what your, be very clear what your goal is, and everything else should support that goal. So in my case with this building, it's about in, in, you know global warming impact, low global warming, high quality housing. So that's the goal. And if panelization works, 
or or modular works to that goal, that's fine. But that's those things need to help meet that goal in the most effective manner. Yeah, that clarity seems really important. Yeah. But but you know, I think they put me they put me in there because they couldn't figure out where else to stick. They didn't know where to put you. Pretty normal. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're I'm used to that. So yeah, that makes sense. We we have more of like a, a grassroots, um, I think, relationship with prefab, in the sense that. Um, Randy and I were really interested in it really early um, in Passive House. I think we built three Passive Houses on site before we rented a space and began to prefab our own wall system design. Um, not dissimilar from the ones that you see like from Collective Carpentry and things like that. They're, they're pretty similar. Um, so we were designing our own walls, building them with our own crew, and then taking them on site to build our custom passive houses and put them in place. Right, right. So we did, I think we did four or five that way mm -hmm. um, with our own systems. Uh, we even did one that had a modular core because it was a remote build on the San Juan Islands, Shaw Island um, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so we put this kind of like mechanical, had the kitchen, bathrooms, mechanical room, put that in the center of the building and it was modular. And then, you know, put the prefab walls around it. Um, Dan Whitmore was a builder at the time and, and he actually um, did some of the site work on that with us. Um, and uh, so, you know, we came to it because we thought it was just so freaking cool, but we lacked the ability to scale, you know, that approach. Um, we couldn't, um, you know, really justify renting the space or keeping a crew tooled and ready to do that for a couple houses a year. And as soon as we started to try and do it for other people, you know, it became very clear that we're, we were just trying to build passive houses. We weren't trying to be a commodity um, kind of producer. Yeah. Um, we're not a manufacturer and, you know, we don't have training in that. We don't know how to do it well, in my opinion. Um, Hence the whole have one target and aim at that. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. a good approach. Right. So um, we kind of shut that down pretty, pretty quickly, um, but never really lost our prefab hopes. Um, and then we, we uh, came up along Collective Carpentry um, a couple years ago and have been working with them ever since. So I would say steadily, um, probably 50 to 60% of our custom passive houses are designed to be prefab now. And I think that that's a lot. going to balloon yeah. this yeah. year. Um, so we have a couple of completed projects, one of which will be the case study I'm going to talk about in the um, conference session with Graham. And uh, we, we see a lot of potential there. And we're working on scaling that up with them too. Um, Roos and I recently bought a new office building in Tumwater. And we're doing a small scale energy retrofit on that right now. Um, nothing, nothing to the passive house standard, but we're really just getting it comfortable, getting the energy usage down as much as we can for the areas we need to touch anyway. Um, but we're really um, getting our company into this small building, getting it functional, and we're building in front of that building because the lot is perfectly laid out for this. It's in, an, in a very urban setting on a main street in Tumwater, Washington. Um, we're going to be building two office spaces and six apartments above, which will be passive house and prefabricated with collective carpentry. Nice. So awesome. awesome. I feel like we're using our experience in the residential realm and we're starting to not only become developers ourselves, but also um, scale it up. Uh, in a way that, that I could see the market actually running with. And what are the advantages of prefab that you see for your passive house practice? Well, for us, I see a better product. You know, I see something drier, more cleanly, more perfectly built, um, typically foam free, because uh, I feel like you get lazy with site built and oftentimes people will see that low hanging fruit in terms of immediate cost and go for the foam. And with prefab, you know, you just, that nobody's prefabbing anything with foam in it. So it's a wonderful way to just yeah. take that step yeah. away from the cheapest way to build a passive house, you know, um, which I feel like we're doing more and more. Um, the other thing I see is that the builders that build these prefab houses are skeptical at first um, about the cost because they see that shell cost and they go, oh, I could do that for cheaper. But I think once they've built a passive house on site and they see how much time and energy goes into um, all the pickup framing, all the air sealing, all the like miscellaneous crap that happens around the actual frame up. Um, I think they see that that's where most of the hours are. And that's really, um, that guesswork is taken out, I feel like, for prefab. So I feel like they limit their liability and they limit their cost, which that in itself, I think, can be 
um, a really good way for contractors to protect themselves as they're doing what can be very innovative, edgy work and be very costly to them, you know, right. as they learn to do it. It can be a, it can be a smaller job for them, but a safer job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like, I feel like the contractors, once they've done a pre, I've gotten lots of feedback like this from our contractors that once they've done a prefab house with, with like collective carpentry, that they feel like the cost is, is apples to apples. I feel like when they're really honest about how much time it would have taken to do that on site, that it's just a wash. Yeah. And if it's just a wash, I'd rather have it faster and a better product. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. I, I was going to say, an, well, so a, another thing that appeals to me about prefabrication, um, and I'm sure Tessa would, well, I, I assume you would agree. I should never, ass <laughs> I'm sure she'll agree with anything I say. But... Um, when you design, pa as an architect, when you do passive house, you're, you go into way more of the details than you're, it, you know, it's, it's a very, ultimately a simple concept, but very intricate. And so there's a lot of work on detail and thinking through everything, not just in terms of will it work, but can it be constructed and all this stuff and be effective. And so my analogy is uh, I almost feel like I, when I when I produce a design and construction documents for a passive house, it's like I've written a concerto, and and then and then I need to turn to have it be built. And it's one thing we don't we don't have a lot of experienced passive house builders in our area. And and from a design standpoint, you can work in a much wider geographical area than a builder can build anyway. So. A lot of our projects are with first time or someone that has no passive house experience at all. So back to this concerto thing, right? So I, I hand the sheet music of the concerto off and I feel like most of the time, if I'm lucky, I will get jazz musicians, <laughs> right? Who can read music and they'll play, you know, they might play through oh, yeah. once. Yeah. My right. tune. And if they're, they're going to go with their master, if they're master improvisers, you'll be in good hands. And that's the best case yeah. scenario. You know, typically it's a garage band where they can't read the music at all, and it just gets tossed, and it whatever gets built gets built. So, the the idea of of panelization or you know prefabrication, where a lot of that uncertainty and you know, and again with you know built and there are built, great builders who've never done this before. And they're enthusiastic and they want to learn but it's always it's always kind of the same learning curve right. and it's always me like i if i you know i'm not a builder but i've seen this before and i wouldn't do that and oh and then the next time they're like oh yeah you told me and i'm like yeah but i like but we just tired of we doing just suffered this. that last right. one and i've done that yeah. you know i've got that i've got that scar well numerous times. i don't know about you but i feel like it's actually like one of the hardest times to help people get these houses built, at least where I live, because builders are so busy, they're booked out. And a lot of the builders we've been working with that are wonderful passive house experience builders, they're very booked out, you know, and people don't want to wait three years to build their house. So I'm working with a lot of new builders for the first time this year. And the prefab takes an enormous amount of pressure off of them to be a passive house expert right out of the gate. Um, additionally, the passive house builders that are booked out are more willing to consider taking the project if it's prefab because it's going to be a faster build. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's more enticing for my my experienced builders, and it's and it's probably really the only way to be successful with my new builders. Right. Right. Yeah, that's compelling. Definitely. It's good stuff. Yeah. So uh, we should we should probably wrap up with the last kind of question here, and so I think I'd like to leave it open to like, what are you either. What are you hoping to get from the conference? What are you looking forward to the conference? Or what do you, what do you see on the horizon um, for yourself or for, for Passive House? So pretty open. I'm just, I mean, being at the conference, I'm already getting what I hoped. I, I brought my son with me. He doesn't want to be on camera, but that's fine. So he's 12, so that's a really great bonding experience. But beyond that, just getting to see all these great people that I unfortunately don't get to see enough and haven't gotten to see in two years anyway. Uh, on the horizon, I'm you know working on rebranding um, my firm. Ironically, well, not I won't say away from Passive House, but less of an emphasis on Passive House up front because I I've come to the conclusion that I just need to establish 
that what I'm doing is great and that people get passive house, yeah. it comes exactly. with it. It's yeah. just there. Um, I like and, that approach. I think that's worked well for us. Yeah. People are like, oh, I like your design work. And we're like, well, great. Let us tell yeah, you that, about I mean, how it, we do that. Yeah. And it's like <laughs> the whole message is like, you're, you, you want this beautifully designed thing. It should perform as well as it looks. Yeah. Um, Beautiful inside and out. Yeah. And then on the other side of it, kind of in tandem with this presentation, I'm also working on what I call pocket production houses. So they're pre-designed with some flexibility, but it's the idea that affording people beautiful, high-performing, healthy, passive houses without them having to be all one-off custom projects. Because the, 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 I don't even know the percentage. The percentage of homes in the United States that are built with an architect involved at all is tiny. It's yeah. got to be under 10%. I think I mean, it's, it's 1%. Yeah. Maybe. It's so teeny. It's something yeah. tiny. So we're not, we're not going to fix the situation we're in designing one at a time. We have to come up with mass production, Maybe was, mass customization, but What was that thing, Skylar? We were joking about with Skylar years ago where it was like saving the world one fancy ass house at a time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I think that was our slogan yeah. for a little while. I mean, I love, I love, um, love custom design and I have no desire to stop doing it. Yeah. But it 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 just it's not needs scalable. to be. It's not it, for yeah, everybody. It needs to be available, and everyone deserves yeah. to have this. Right. How do you how do you leverage yeah. design yeah. To, to really? Yeah. How do you get everyone more? in nice spaces? Plus, yeah. if I could design, I mean, if I can build design my thing and it gets built ten or a hundred thousand times, I mean, that's pretty cool. That, that would be good. Yeah, that would be good in, in many ways. That would yeah. be good, I imagine. I would say, um, you know, the takeaways that I'm here for are really similar to Graham's. I, I find it interesting how all of us working in our little beehives at home can um, come to such similar conclusions. Because um, we've, we've got a couple things going on that are really similar. We have um, a, a Shopify portion of our website that we'll be rolling out here in the next few months. Oh, cool. That are pre-designed passive house uh, house plans. Um, there's going to be, we're actually going to start with a bunch of ADUs because we feel like that's a way we can address uh, density right away. And uh, you can watch for that because we're just working through the final details of the plan sets. And I'm working through the final details of the legality of selling plans on a national scale, uh, which is uh, quite, it's exactly as tricky as you think it is. Yeah. So, I didn't think it was tricky, but now I, I'm starting to worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I feel like I feel like I get so much out of these conferences. Um, I just feel like I get so much out of the friendships and the inspiration. I feel like I get re-excited about what I'm doing every time I come. And it's always perfect timing. Like I always feel a little beat down or a little bit like, oh man, I wish I wish we were doing this or that or doing more of it. I think uh, Roos and I are both really um, inspired and enthused about our small multifamily project we're going to be developing. Uh, we've never done a, a multifamily passive house, although we have started to do a lot more multifamily generally this year. Um, our firm has grown a lot in the commercial and multifamily re you know, realm. Um, so I think we have a lot to learn for how to do you know, passive house apartments and how to do passive house offices. Uh, and I think we're, we're really excited about that because we can learn on our own dime. Uh, we can learn. Um, we can be a little bit more experimental, I think. Um, because, you know, we don't um, have to make sure that we're flawlessly performing for a client. So yeah. I think that, um, so we have fresh energy, I think, around that at this conference. So we're like attending, you know, workshops we might not have attended before and looking at products we would have never noticed before. And so it's it's kind of like, um, it's sort of like being into it for the first time a little bit, which is really fun. That is cool. Um, yeah, I think that's, it's great to see everybody. Yeah, it is. I want to circle back for a moment to yes. or to oh. Tessa's origin story. I was waiting. Good. 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 That's so right. I we remember her. That, I remember her being very young, very cool, very smart, and having bleach blonde hair. I had like a mohawk. I had like was a little a, faux hawk a, oh, kind of know, thing. I thought it was more like a yeah. Amy Mann style, but maybe those I'm were, wrong. Those were those were my roller derby days. Okay. And I remember there was someone who was super annoying, but it wasn't you. And we don't need to go into that. I don't remember. Yeah. 
Someone was really annoying and angry, but it wasn't you. I don't no, remember. she was super. She was super cool. She was one of the smartest. I would like. People I would, in the, in I'm the just gonna lean into the mic sure. here. I would like everyone to know that Graham Irwin said I'm not annoying. <laughs> I, well, you weren't then. <laughs> you did, Things change. Things change. Actually, that was. <laughs> Uh, awesome. This will be the first Passive House conference that I won't be drinking at, too. That's really weird. Why is that, Tessa? That's because I'm pregnant. I want everyone to know. Yeah. I don't think I've just eaten a bunch of sandwiches. <laughs> yeah. It's my first sober Passive House conference. That's new, too. I jokingly call her my annoying little sister because of you know how this whole thing started with us. But and now it's, I'm it's saying she's, she's actually creeping up on adulthood in an <laughs> alarming way. When she's becoming a parent, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a quick way she, to become I an was, adult. Uh, well, not unfortunately, not everyone, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's certainly not guaranteed. Some people I can speak for personal experience. <laughs> but I, I mean, I I had a bit of a misspent youth, I'll be honest. And I remember seeing Tessa at her age, and I was You're like, like wow, "Oh my god!" Talk about precocious. <laughs> I know. You know. I mean, I was like, I know. not twice your age at the time, but it, yeah. like, yeah, I was like, "Wow, you're," you know, you may have missed some. I didn't interesting miss stories that or I whatever. I missed some of my 30s, but back on track. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. you guys, this is awesome. Great, great chat, and so it's so good to be with you. You, you too. Know, it is. So. Thanks for thanks. Thanks Old for interviewing friends. me. Yeah. Good reunion.